Something remarkable is happening in the clouds that affect all life on Earth, but so far biology cannot explain it. Understanding life has never been easy. Its very complexity is puzzling. Why is there such variety? It took genius to discover the answer. In 1859, Charles Darwin realized that no matter how different animals may appear, they are all related to each other. It was a revelation. Darwin saw the invisible link between all creatures, an infinitely slow process that connects us all. He called it evolution. Evolution is a battleground, the survival of the fittest, a constant, ruthless struggle for resources and reproduction. But there was something that even Darwin couldn't explain, a problem left for others to solve, altruism. Darwin said if you could find a case where um, an organism did something solely for the sake of the good, you know, good of another organism, then this would annihilate my theory. Worker bees seem to deny Darwin's theory. They're like kamikazes. To protect the hive, they will sting, even though it costs them their own life. How can such behavior evolve in a world that is shaped by natural selection? This was biology's greatest paradox, and it took another genius to solve the puzzle. Evolutionary biologist Bill Hamilton could see a realm that Darwin couldn't even imagine. Darwin's basic argument seemed to show a very selfish living world, and yet this didn't seem to be what one saw around, so he felt one needed a, a middle path. In 1964, Bill Hamilton discovered that altruistic behavior can be explained if one looks beyond the individual and takes a gene's eye view of nature. He saw that from the point of view of genes, it didn't really matter much if one individual lived or died because a copy of the same genes lived on in all the other individuals that it was related to. The essence of Bill Hamilton's theory was that when we think about natural selection, we have to think at the gene level rather than just at the individual level. The individual is the machine or vehicle which carries the genes about. Bill Hamilton took Darwinian thinking into a new dimension one that the rest of the scientific world is only just catching up with. But sadly, his life was cut short while he was pursuing yet more answers. Today we pay tribute to a man who showed that nature can be kind or altruistic as well. His name is Bill Hamilton, or was, because he's just died in the Congo in his quest for more evidence of cooperative tendencies in the wild. He's been called the greatest evolutionary biologist since Darwin. The scientific world has lost one of its most original thinkers. He was a person that had as an incredible freedom, sense of the freedom, and freedom in his mind. Bill Hamilton was an um, extraordinarily um, thoughtful person with a, a deep love of nature, I think. He was a very brave man. As his, as his death showed, he would go into the wildest and <laughs> uh, most dangerous places to further his science. I think what we can learn from Bill is the value of open and honest and uninhibited scientific inquiry. Most of us have, you know, say three to five ideas in our life 
and so the chances of one of them being brilliant is pretty much nil. And you know, maybe occasionally someone will actually manage to have 10 ideas and one of them will be good. Well, Bill had 100 ideas and 10 of them were good, which is extraordinary. He really was genuinely a little bit like um, Isaac Newton. Newton saw gravity occurring and he asked the question why. A typical example with Bill was seeing the, um, the beautiful autumn colors of leaves and not taking it for granted like most of us do or saying, yes, very pretty, I'll take a photograph, but actually saying there's, there's an evolutionary reason behind this. I can actually ask the question, why? Hamilton was born in 1936 and grew up in the countryside, fascinated by nature and its patterns. There were several factors in my childhood that made me more likely than others to think about this. One was being part of a fairly large family and realizing even as a child that I thought very differently about my family members than I did about everybody else. Also, I think my mother kept honeybees and understanding at an earlier age than most the organization of these incredible communities I think primed me to see again that uh, there is something very special there about close relatives uh, which enables these incredible acts of altruism to occur. By coincidence Hamilton grew up in the same corner of Britain as Darwin just a few miles from his house. Hamilton's sister, Dr. Mary Bliss, still lives at Oakley, the home of an inspired childhood. One of my main images is Bill sitting at the dining room table with his uh, setting boards and pins, setting out the catches of the day, setting them out very, very meticulously so that he could then add them to his collection. This early fascination would lead Hamilton on a lifelong quest to understand what he observed in nature. On a childhood excursion, Hamilton visited Down House, the home where Charles Darwin wrote his famous theory of natural selection. From here it was clear which path he would follow. Hamilton would devote his life to explore evolutionary biology. And rather than seeking answers from a desk, Hamilton, like Darwin, would always search for clues in the real world, believing nature itself would show the way. They were observing things when they walked around this countryside round here, and Bill was fascinated by this bit of country, just as uh, Darwin was himself. So they had great similarities in their approach, self-questioning endlessly. But as devoted as he was to Darwin, even as a student, Hamilton recognized there were problems with classic evolutionary theory. He searched for a way to solve the puzzle of the behavior of social insects like worker bees. Once born, they devote their lives to the hive. They have a remarkable adaptation, a super effective sting with one catch. The sting is barbed. Once used, it cannot be withdrawn. In effect, it is a suicide machine. How can a weapon designed to protect others, which causes its owner's death, make evolutionary sense? Darwin himself was worried about bees and other social insects, how it was that the adaptations shown by worker bees and worker ants, which are after all sterile, could get passed on through the generations. Hamilton was the first to realize that the explanation lies in the unique genetic makeup of insect communities. Sterile workers who are female are extra specially closely related to their younger sisters who are going to be reproductive young queens. So when a worker ant or bee looks at a young queen who is her sister, 
that young queen is almost an identical twin to her. For the workers, it makes more genetic sense to devote their lives to the young queens than to reproduce themselves. They can give up their own future because it is already contained within someone else. That's the essence of the Hamilton theory. Genes working through one individual are looking after copies of themselves in other individuals. He recognized that there's sort of a continuity among organisms, that it isn't just each individual acting by him or herself, it's that everybody is acting in relation to how much their genes are represented in other individuals. Um, and, and this was really a tremendous insight. But how can animals calculate how much of their genes are in others? Every time you catch a ball, every time you play tennis and manage to return a ball, your brain and your muscles and your nerves are behaving as if they were solving very complicated differential equations. You, you're not aware of that. You probably don't even know what a differential equation is when you catch a ball, but you can still catch the ball. And in exactly the same way, a bird or an insect or a lion behaves as if it had made this complicated calculation. Genes are driving behavior, searching for copies of themselves in others, according to Hamilton, even in humans. Hamilton's rule was uh, neatly described by J.B.S. Haldane, who said that he would lay down his life for two brothers or eight cousins. So two brothers because one has on average about half the genes in common with one brother or one sister. Uh, and so two brothers is equivalent to oneself. The essence of the idea is that altruism has a genetic and biological basis. And that's the way that it, it carries on and exists in everyone you see around you. And the, the vehicle for this, and this is the fascinating thing to me, the vehicle for how altruism takes place is by the emotion of love. I think of my three children, I don't think of them as here are biological entities that have half my genes in common. I think of my three dear children whom I love and have affection for. And that is the means by which resources, care and protection are channeled into those with whom we have about half our genes in common uh, at the maximum. Hamilton was only a young postgraduate in London when he began writing his ideas. This was a very lonely time for him. He felt really quite isolated. Very few people there seemed to understand the significance of what he was working on. Well, he was worried that his work would not be recognized, might not even be published. But uh, he was very convinced that uh, it would be very important. It took decades for his ideas to be universally recognized. In 1993, he was awarded the Kyoto Prize, after the Nobel, the most prestigious accolade in science. One of the most fond moments which actually characterizes in some senses his rather uh, modest, quiet way was that one night after we'd been working in Floating Meadow and uh, we'd both got a, um, a glass with some ice, a large amount of um, whiskey in it, when um, a wasp came, from, came to the light and then stung me. And then I got stung by a second one. So I put my drink down and I was digging inside my shirt, you know, fighting for the wasp when uh, grabbed this boss, got it out, and went, damn, I've got it. And Bill said, oh, oh yes, it's a so-and-so. Oh, actually, I know the name of this, actually. Um, in fact, it's named after me. <laughs> and the look of shyness on his face as he admitted that it was a Hamiltonian, an actual species was named after him. It's sort of strange sort of sense of modesty, embarrassment almost. Mm. 
Now at last, acknowledged as a world-leading evolutionary scientist, Hamilton was not about to stop. He was not somebody that just sort of rested on, okay, I've had this one idea, I had it when I was 32, and when I'm 72 or 82 or 92, I'm still going to be talking about this one idea and reflecting on, you know, how wonderful it was and everything else. I mean, he, he was just thinking about things all the time. In the mid-90s, he began exploring an idea about life that was so novel that even evolution itself may not explain it. And using light microscopy, we can see the same algal cells here. Ironically, it started with an argument he had with another maverick British scientist, James Lovelock. I first met Bill Hamilton here in Oxford. He was a great opponent of my ideas and entirely disagreed with everything I said. We were unable to resolve our differences about the matter of uh, Gaia, whether this was a real phenomenon or not. And at the end of it all, um, we agreed to differ. We spent a very pleasant evening arguing together and finishing up, saying, oh, well, <laughs> that's your view of it, and this is my view of it. James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis argues that planet Earth is self-regulating, that collectively life is able to control the environment according to its own best interest. Life and the planet are a single system. The more influence uh, life has in the universe, the better as far as I'm concerned. So it would be nice to think of the whole world as a one living organism in some sense. However, I had great difficulty with the idea of how such a coordinated organism could arise. He took this as a challenge. He didn't just say, it can't happen at all. He just said, we don't know yet how it happens. As always, Hamilton looked for a real example in nature, not theory. Some direct evidence that showed Gaia at work. Lovelock suggested he investigate the role marine algae play in climate control. Without the algae, the Earth would be 10 degrees Celsius warmer than it is now. In the mid-80s, Lovelock established that marine algae are helping clouds to form over the sea. He saw this as evidence of Gaia. Lovelock argued the microscopic marine algae were working as a thermostat regulating the temperature of planet Earth. The marine algae produce a gas which oxidizes in the atmosphere to form the tiny water-soluble droplets around which water condenses and forms the clouds we see in the sky. Without these droplets, rain would just fall from a cloudless sky and the sun could come through and warm the earth. So algae are producing a gas that form clouds and cool the planet. But no one could explain why. Hamilton was intrigued. He thought that here there might be a link between the, the, the views of evolutionary biologists on how such a thing could have evolved and what we were finding in the way of regulation. Here was life not just adapting to the environment, but actively changing it for no apparent reason, something that natural selection could not explain. An evolutionist immediately asks, why the hell should these uh, algae in the sea be producing clouds which are going to benefit the land and benefit everyone else, in fact, benefit other organisms much more than it benefits themselves. Hooked on the problem, Hamilton started to work together with Lovelock's colleague, Tim Lenton, to find an answer. They noticed that algae seemed to produce gas in the greatest quantities around the gigantic algae blooms that form in the oceans. Hamilton theorized that algae might be using the gas to escape from the crowded conditions at the end of a bloom when nutrients run out. I think he made a connection to uh, an earlier piece of work he'd done which showed that the dispersal of organisms is um, usually favored by natural selection. 
I found numerous examples of insects, for example, that would go through a number of generations of wingless insects, and then as the bark began to dry out, they would start producing winged forms. I would say this is very closely parallel to what we're talking about, that when things are good, then you just save on any unnecessary uh, appendages, you grow as fast as you can, but once things begin to look tough, then you produce wings and you try to fly away. For algae trapped in a crowded bloom, the only way out is up. But algae don't have wings. How could they find a way of escaping through the air? Hamilton had an answer. We already know of what are called bubble processes. The minute bubbles from a breaking white top on the sea uh, rise through the sea and burst, so causing the, the white top. Uh, algae attach themselves to the surface of the bubble. They rise with the bubble, and as the bubble bursts on the sea surface, there is a kind of a tiny fountain springs out of the bottom of the bursting bubble, and uh, they are thrown into the air at least uh, a few centimeters. When the water vapor around the algae gas condenses into cloud droplets, enormous heat is released, sucking the air up from below any airborne algae could be getting a ride. If these plankton were getting injected into the air, the winds across the ocean would transport them and drop them into a different part of the ocean, and that that would benefit them. It could pay back evolutionarily. Algae use bursting bubbles to get airborne, and the gas they produce helps lift them to high altitudes. Hamilton and Lenton compiled their thoughts in a paper suggesting why algae might be flying with their clouds. But it was just an interesting hypothesis. Evidence would need to be found in the real world. In 1998, Hamilton funded aerobiologist William Marshall to try and find algae in the air above the sea. A day like today, it's very windy. We've got lots of white caps. Any organisms that are in the water column are going to be being ejected into the air column and we're hoping to catch that today. The air samples were cultured in the laboratory. Would they reveal algae? And would they have the ability to colonise new environments? You can see these are collections over here that we made eight, nine weeks ago. This shows quite clearly that we've got algae that we've collected and we've observed under the microscope on the strips and this tells us that those algae are viable and they can grow. So they are potential colonizers for new areas in the sea. It was a promising start. Now Hamilton planned to investigate high above the oceans to see if algae were being dispersed by clouds. I believe that we're going to find that a lot of these things do fly really long distances, and if so, we need to look for them up in the clouds. Hamilton had found a reason for the algae to form their clouds that made evolutionary sense, dispersal. But he knew it raised a deeper, more complex question. Algae through clouds are regulating the Earth's temperature, but what process was setting the thermostat? There was nothing in natural selection to answer that. What Lovelock originally described, what we have confirmed with an evolutionary mechanism, is a thermostat. There's no doubt about that. The clouds will go up, they'll reflect the sunlight, they'll cool the planet. But who is setting the thermostat to switch off at a particular point? What, what is achieving it in such a way that uh, life will benefit? This is what uh, is missing at the moment. It's a profound question that points to life operating in a way we can't yet explain. But sadly, it will be others who must seek the answer. Bill Hamilton only lived long enough to pose this fascinating problem. In many ways, he was in the peak of his career. He was still generating a lot of ideas. I mean, he was amazingly fecund in his mind. 
Hamilton was fearless, both in life and in science. He was prepared to pursue ideas that upset the scientific establishment. As an evolutionist, he was concerned that sudden changes brought about by modern medicine could interfere with the flow of evolution with devastating consequences. And that is what took him on his last journey into the Congo on a search for the origin of AIDS. He was investigating claims that a polio vaccine cultured in monkey tissues may have allowed the virus to cross species. He was looking for the possible presence of SIV, that simian immunodeficiency virus. That's the, um, the chimpanzee SIV is known to be the direct ancestor of HIV-1, the virus that's caused the AIDS pandemic. I was very much against uh, this mission because the, the country was in a civil war, because there were risks of getting sick. But he felt that that was his duty to go there. He just believed that the truth is frightfully important and therefore he had to get to the very essence and the truth of the origin of AIDS. He just balanced the risk to his personal life versus the importance of the science. Bill Hamilton died on the 7th of March 2000 from complications following a bout of cerebral malaria. The man is gone but his ideas will influence science for years to come. For those that had the privilege to work with him, there's a, a, a rich legacy of, of work to be done, um, questions to pursue further. He told me many times he had such a wonderful life, so he was prepared to die, even if it was uh, so enthusiast, so young in his mind, so young in his heart, that uh, mm, he loved life very much. Brought by the wind higher up in the troposphere, all of you will form the clouds, and wandering across the ocean, you will fall down and fly up again and again till eventually a drop of rain will join you to the water of the flooded forest of the Amazon.